I keep getting these long list of questions and rather than trying to answer them one by one in a short or a reel, I figured I'd do a question and answer session. So I'm sitting here with six questions and let's get to it. So the first one was about jobs in prison. What are they available? What have I done and what did I learn? So the first job I got, when I first got to Nottaway, guys told me like, apply for every job. Like, you know, it's important to have something, but they're never gonna hire you in the wood shop. They only hire older guys or guys who are more experienced. I put in for all the jobs and the first job I got was in the wood shop. I was 19 year old. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't understand prison politics at all. It was just a totally different world, but it was good for me because it gave me structure. They moved me to the woodshop pod where I moved in with Greg the serial killer. I got up every morning early. I worked all day. I came back. I did a little workout. I read, I did some college stuff and I went to sleep. So it was like building a structure that I needed through those years. Then after that, I got a job on the paint crew. I was a houseman cleaning the showers or cleaning the pod. I was in the law library. I worked maintenance. I was a tutor. I, I did pretty much everything. Because I realized that getting out after prison, I'd have a lot of strikes against me and I didn't have as many skills and as many kind of like comfort areas as possible. Because if I've worked in an area, even if I haven't done that specifically, I have a gist of or the idea of what I'm doing or how to get along or even just job dynamics or office, office dynamics. So that's why it was important to have as much variety as possible. And when I got out, I could jump on whatever opportunity was there because this is not what I imagined my life to be. Like I really thought my life was going to be something dramatically different. So some of the best jobs that I had or yeah, maintenance jobs, because I was all over the compound. I'd be going places, I'd be up on the roof. Like nobody gets to go on the roof. Like you can get on the roof and you can see for almost miles in all these directions and you can see the sky and it's wide and open. And it's just, it was such an amazing experience. Or even the law library, like I had the amazing joy of helping a guy go home. So we had guys come there all the time. I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of guys on a regular basis. And I never had good news for him. It was always, hey, you know, I'm sorry. Like that's not what this says. Or hey, you pleaded guilty, so you gave up your right to appeal. Like, it was always bad news. And then this guy comes in and said, hey, you know, I got an issue with my case. So he had been convicted of possession of a concealed weapon by a convicted felon, which normally would be a firearm, but also is a dark dagger-like weapon if it's a knife. So he came to me and he was like, look, the cop lied. Like, he said I had my jacket over it, but I didn't have my jacket over it. And I was like, okay, well, you know, we can look at that. But honestly, this is just going to be his word, his word versus yours. And if you were convicted, I don't know that it worked. He goes, yeah, and I just, I can't believe it, man. It was just like a, it was a, a knife set, like a chef's knife set. I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like, they convicted you for a chef knife set? He was like, yeah. So we went back, we looked at the paperwork, and sure enough, that's what he'd been convicted of. So he looked, and again, in the statute, it's dark dagger or like weapon. It's not a chef knife. Like, that does not meet the definition to be a concealed weapon by code. So we actually filed an appeal. He did most of the work. I just kind of pointed in the right direction. And then all of a sudden, he's gone. Like, he was released from prison because he had been basically arrested on a charge that wasn't a charge. It's like we had a guy, he got a driving on a suspended license for being on a moped when you don't need a license to be on a moped and nobody caught it. Like not his public defender, not the prosecutor. Like he actually did time for driving a suspended license moped when that wasn't a crime. Like, so that's two people that were in prison for not committing a crime. So people who say don't commit the crime, just remember it can happen. But I think in the end it was the uh, being a mentor in the mental health program that was the most meaningful because it wasn't an official job and they actually offered it to me as a job. But if I had taken that, I wouldn't have been able to continue to be a maintenance worker, which meant I wouldn't have been able to continue to get my hours for the apprenticeship so I could get my journeyman card. And it was really important to me to have all the certifications and all the opportunities moving forward. So when I got out, I could jump into work as an electrician or jump into work doing whatever. But so I did it on a volunteer basis and I ran Jeopardy games and I ran, you know, services. I taught classes like I was able to interact with people and meet where they were, and I was able to provide a service that wasn't being provided. Because we had some really good mental health professionals, but they just didn't have the time, and they didn't have the energy, and they didn't have the resources to be there for everybody. And you've got that little 5% of guys that are seriously mentally ill, they take up all their time and all their resources and all their energy. So being able to be a peer support specialist, being able to be a liaison between them and mental health was really meaningful. Like I was able to actually show up for guys and I still get messages today or emails or letters where guys are saying thank you or we, we appreciate this or I learned this when you did that. Um, and that was about the most gratifying thing it could be because I think it's nice to make a bunch of money, it's nice to have prestige, it's nice to do whatever, but doing work that genuinely affects people's lives is the thing that's the most important to me. The second one was commissary items. Like what kind of items do they have on commissary? Well, um, you know, the most mostly I just bought noodles and rice and peanut butter and oatmeal. Like I didn't try to spend a lot of money. Some guys would do that. I would tend to spend more money on music because we could buy it off the kiosk or I would spend money on, you know, on the phone so I could call home. But I, yeah, generally it was like variations on that. I would buy like mackerel and tuna fish. The mackerel ended up being a little bit cheaper. And I would try to get all the protein and all the kind of healthy stuff I could because we didn't get a lot of that in the chow hall. Like what you really needed was like vitamins and, and protein. So I could buy vitamins from the chow, or from a commissary, which was really nice. And at one point I started just like eating everybody's vegetables. So even though they were boiled down to a mush, I figured eventually I was gonna get some vitamins out of that. 
and it was a lot of fiber and it was really good for me. So a lot of the time, I, or I guess near the end, I started actually cutting out a lot of the soups and a lot of the rice and just having vegetables. So it would just be like a big bowl of squash and a mackerel or a big bowl of whatever, broccoli and, and a tuna fish. And if it sounds delicious, you're crazy because it really was not delicious. But I found that if you put enough hot sauce on it, if you put enough other things, it would make a difference. And we did, we had condiments like uh, mayo and ketchup and hot sauce, that really helped. You could buy sodas and candy and you know, kind of junk food like honey buns. And those were really popular. Um, but generally it was like your hygiene items, your toothbrush, your, your toothpaste, your, your deodorant, your soap, your shampoo, all that stuff you could buy. And then it was food, the general food things you could do. <coughs> and when I first got to Buckingham, I remember they used to have a Christmas special where like every Christmas there'd be extra items you could get. And I thought it was so cool because they had, um, what do you call it? Like yogurt covered raisins, which were, I mean, uh, yogurt covered pretzels, which were my favorite things ever. And then they stopped the special list and I remember being so disappointed. But it's like a really bad corner store that you don't actually get to go into, but instead you like scan a list. And somebody pointed this out. I've never been to a place that had it, but they said that they're more and more going to kiosks where rather than filling your thing out on a bubble sheet like you would for your SAT, you actually go to the kiosk and you put your order in there. So I guess that's like closer to the reality. Like that's what you do when you go to some restaurants now. So, all right, fat people in prison. People want to know if you could come in fat or if you could get fat in prison. So we had a lot of guys come in fat. As a matter of fact, during the pandemic, we were really worried because we were in the honor pod and they came in and they measured all the beds and we thought they were gonna put in more beds to double it up because we were the only people who had single cells. And we were like, oh my God, please don't do this. But what it was, was the jail had beds that kept breaking because they had these really like cheaply constructed beds. So they were actually getting the uh, dimensions from our beds and then gonna pay the metal shop to build those beds that were ours to put in the jail because they had so many overweight people breaking the beds. So it definitely happens. And in the Department of Corrections, I've seen some really big guys uh, there was one guy who I just, I remember wondering like how he functioned. I mean, he was probably the largest individual I've ever seen up close. Uh, and yeah, he used to have to walk to the chow hall and he would sit there and he would just eat everybody's tray, you know, day after day. It was kind of heartbreaking. But as far as getting fat in prison, you know, a lot of guys get depressed. There isn't a lot to do. There isn't a lot of activity and moving around and doing things. So guys end up just sitting around and being depressed and eating and sleeping. And so guys can get fat. They'll eat all the potatoes or all the bread in the chow hall. We had one guy who would literally bring back like a bag of bread every day. He would just go around and ask for all the bread or sit at the tray slot and ask for all the bread people were throwing away. And then he would skip back and he would eat it. Or if he had money, he would put peanut butter on it or he would put something else on it. And it was just watching him eat like a loaf of bread every single day on top of everything else he was eating. And sure enough, he got really heavy. And it broke my heart because, again, these were people that didn't have another alternative. It'd be one thing if like, you're living a good life and you're, you're, you're eating rich food and you're having fun, but sitting around and pounding a loaf of bread a day because you're depressed and you're compulsively eating, like there's nothing fun or glorious or okay about that. Uh, reading, exercise, and meditation now that I'm out. So this is, this is an interesting topic. So inside, I had this incredible structure where I read every day, I meditated every day, I exercised. Like I had this structure that my life was built around. It was actually really meaningful. So I tell people that what I lived was not a prison experience, but a monastic experience. I tried to imagine a monk like trying to achieve something great, trying to become the best version of himself or trying to connect to something higher than himself. And that's what I was doing. So inside that was great because I knew every morning I would meditate, every count time I would meditate. You know, every day I would exercise, I would either do this or this. Like I had a setup that really worked and getting out, that was really hard to balance because all of a sudden the world is really busy. Like I gotta go to DMV, I've gotta go to work, I've gotta go all these places. So I don't have this structure. And at first I was really good about making sure I did all these things, you know, and I was still lifting weights every day and I was still doing this. And then slowly it's kind of like gone into this ebb and flow. Like I sat and meditated this morning, but I don't think I sat and meditated yesterday. And it used to be, I did not miss a day. Like there was not a day in my life that I didn't meditate. There was not a day that I didn't read. I read two or three books a week for years. And I think I've probably read two or three books since I've been out of prison, which is almost 11 months. So I've, I've had to kind of recreate that structure. I've had to understand what that balance is. And I've had to you know, recognize priorities. I would like to sit down and read more. I have two books sitting on the table right in front of me. And my plan was to take some time to read it and I probably will, but it's been hard to fit everything in. And I recognize that that structure is what allowed me to become the person that I am. And I wanna make sure I have not necessarily that structure, but a structure that is based on something as healthy and as balanced as I had inside, because I know that's what allowed me to get to the place that I was. So I'm working on it. Uh, making friends in prison. I'd say making friends in prison is the same as making friends out in the world. Like you find people with common interests, you find people that you happen to work with or do things with, you have a common experience with, and then you bond over that. Now, most of the people in prison, I wouldn't have talked to on the outside. Just, I wouldn't have run into them. We wouldn't have had reason to talk. But what I found was almost everybody had something valuable to teach or to share. There was a human connection or like a capability for connection that I didn't realize, that I hadn't recognized before I went in. And it really kind of, 
It caused me to be more open-minded than I'd ever been before, to recognize that there's always an opportunity for a relationship or for learning or for an interaction. And so that changed the way that I looked at the world. Rather than being like, oh man, I don't like that guy, I don't wanna be around him, I would be open-minded to be like, man, I wonder if I can learn something from her. I wonder what I can talk to him about. I wonder what kind of thing we'll find out we share. And it wasn't always like perfect and idealistic. And sometimes I didn't, really didn't like guys or sometimes we just didn't get along or sometimes I just didn't enjoy talking to people. But it was something that really changed the perspective I have on people because I recognized every person is an opportunity to learn and every person is an opportunity to connect. When I saw that, rather than I don't wanna be around this guy or I don't like this guy, it changed the nature of the interaction and it felt freer, it felt more rewarding. So prosthetics. So there was a copay in the Department of Corrections Medical for the longest time. I think they took it away maybe four or five years ago, but it used to be you had to pay five bucks just to show up and then you had to pay two bucks for any kind of medication. So like if you went over there and they prescribed you Advil, you had to pay five bucks to show up and you had to pay two bucks for Advil which doesn't sound bad, except that you make, you know, 27 cents an hour or 45 cents an hour. So that seven bucks represents a significant chunk of your paycheck. They ended up getting rid of that. But back when they had that, and I think they actually still have an issue with this today, back when they had that, okay, that seven bucks was reasonable, but if you needed dentures, it was gonna cost you 90 bucks. If you needed a prosthetic, it was gonna cost you whatever degree. And so it was like hundreds and hundreds of dollars for some of these things that guys couldn't afford. I think glasses were like 12 bucks or they went up to like 17 bucks. And it was like those represented significant chunks. <clears throat> so we had one guy, DC, who's the one I think of, who got, well, he says he got blown up in the Gulf War. I don't know whether that's true. I've, I've been told the dude was a liar. The only thing that wasn't in question was the fact that he was missing a leg from the knee down, but he was just like workout and martial arts fanatic. Like he was out there like lifting weights, doing crazy stuff. Like he was boxing. Like when they had the smokers, he had one leg and was boxing competitively, which I still think is absolutely amazing. Um, but he would do this workout stuff and he kept having issues with his prosthetic. Like they wouldn't give him whatever it is that he's supposed to cover the nub on his leg, but they wouldn't give him the right prosthetic or he kept, he kept going around with this and he kept having problems. And then finally, literally after years, he got the right one and he was like strutting on the yard. He was like happy and proud and said he was comfortable and he could move good. So those things were made available, but they're basically gonna be made available by the lowest you know, bidding vendor, which means probably the lowest quality product and you're gonna have a lot of issues. It was like with the CPAP machines where guys would say they need them, that they had sleep apnea, and eventually, however many weeks or months it took to get diagnosed with sleep apnea, then they would order it and it would take however many weeks or months to get it. So those things were available, but they didn't come quickly and they often come in very poor quality, which again is better than what you're gonna get out on the street if you don't have any money or you don't have any insurance or you don't have access to those things. So it's not that there's no benefit to it. It's just that it's not what people imagine about like this amazing medical care. But um, I mean, we had guys with different issues. I'm trying to think, we had one guy with one arm and they never gave him a prosthetic. I, I don't know, I, I guess it's just a issue because his was basically like at the shoulder. Uh, so they never gave him a prosthetic. Uh, the, the guy with the knee, or missing from the knee down, he had it. I think we had another guy who was missing a foot. Like he had like kind of literally cut off at the bottom of his leg. I don't know if he'd lost it from diabetes or whatever, but I don't remember him getting one either. Um, I think he was just in a wheelchair, but yeah, it was made available eventually. <clears throat> and then performances and poetry. Like, were people ever allowed to have performances? Did people put on shows? You know, I've talked about being in the hole one time and there was this one guy who was down there who would sing to us every night and everybody would shut up and everybody would just lay back and listen to him sing because he had a great voice. And that was a powerful thing. And that was when we realized the ability of art and, and kind of a performer to change the whole, the feel, the, the kind of structure, that change everything. So every year at Buckingham, there would be a special day in the summer where everybody would be out on both yards. We would have the soccer championship, the basketball championship, the baseball or softball championship. Like it was a big day. And one of the big events that was unofficial was guys going to the fence. And it started out with rap battles. Like guys from each side would be like the best on their side and they would go have a rap battle at the fence and it would be like judged based on the crowd's reaction, like who won or who did the best. But then guys would go up there and they would sing. And then guys would get up there and perform acapella or guys would do whatever. It became poetry, it became uh, a spoken word. It became like this amazing thing. And we had this awesome principal. And she recognized this year after year. Like on those days, the staff would walk around and they would interact with us more than they normally would. And she would see this and she was like, we need to give these guys a platform. Like this is empowerment. Like this is giving people a platform to do something good rather than waste time or get high or get into fights or get into gang stuff. So she put together a program and it had some baselines. Like none of the lyrics could have anything to do with gangs. They couldn't encourage violence. They couldn't have like sexual stuff. So there was a limitation on what it was, but then she gave people the opportunity to do performances. And on one hand, it was amazing. On the other hand, it wasn't because people kind of held back. Like people didn't believe in it yet. They didn't trust it. They thought it was a trick or they thought it was corny or it's like, you're at the fence on the yard. Like, why won't you go over to the gym and sign up for this program? But a lot of people really just didn't trust the system, didn't trust anything official because they thought it was a setup or they thought it made them look a certain way. 
But when that happened, it was amazing to see what people would do. I remember Q, who was also a mentor in the mental health program, he would do this spoken word poetry. And if you wanna talk about like powerful, like you know how when you start doing something, there's always somebody in the back talking and like there's this other noise and like people are just still kind of living their lives even when somebody's performing. Man, two or three words in, everybody was quiet. Like he commanded the room. You could hear it in his voice. You could hear it in his passion. And when he would speak what he was speaking, it was like everybody was paying attention. And at the end, there would be this pause because we would just still be kind of like awestruck. And then there would be thunderous applause because he was amazing at what he did. And he had never written poetry before in his life. He was sitting in the hole in the jail. They stuck him in the hole for like a year while he was in the jail because they said he was a security risk. So he's sitting back there and he's hopeless and he's writing this woman in Richmond. And this woman is like, look, you know, you're such a smart guy. You need to write poetry. He's like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I don't... I don't know how to write poetry. I've never written poetry. But he's like writing to her every day because he's got nothing to do because he's sitting in the hole. And he starts writing this poetry. And she's like, look, I want you to submit this. Like, just send this to the thing. And he sent it off and he won. Like, who has never written poetry or read poetry a day in his life, who dropped out of school, wrote these amazing, powerful words. And that was what made him realize, like, wait, there is something else I can do. I don't have to just sell drugs. I don't just have to be this person. I can be more because someone believed in him. Someone validated his better self rather than his lower self. And I always thought that was so important. So whenever I saw somebody making music or drawing or doing anything creative or anything artistic, I really tried to hone in on that as showing people like, look, you can do something amazing. What you're doing here is what other people cannot do. This is wonderful. Like focus on this. And they'd be like, yeah, but how am I gonna pay the bills? Like I can sling dope and make money. I can't make money doing this. And I would often, and not always, but teach them, okay, well you can make cards. Like you can do portraits, you can do this. Okay, you like music? hey, you know what, you're probably not gonna make it big. Like, it's really hard to make it big in the music industry, but you can devote your life to this. You can let this be a passion, or you can go sing in church, or you can have something that you're doing that is contributing to the people around you. Because I say, don't you like it when so-and-so does this, or when so-and-so sings, or when so-and-so raps? They're like, yeah. So, so that makes your life better, so you have the opportunity to be the person who's making someone else's life better. And I always tried to focus on that, because what I realized is the biggest thing people needed to find was hope. Because getting out of prison, the number one failure was a failure of imagination. People didn't believe they could be anything other than what they had been before. They didn't believe they could live any other life. They didn't believe there was any hope for them. They really saw it as, I can go work a minimum wage job and be poor and broke and not be able to do anything, or I can go back to my old life. They didn't realize they could come out like a friend of mine who's a CFO of a nonprofit organization. They didn't realize they could come up and run a trucking company. They didn't realize they could come up and succeed doing all the things that they're doing now because nobody believed in them and nobody told them that. So one of my big messages while I was inside was to encourage guys to believe in something bigger, to have a, 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 an imagination, the audacity of hope, as Barack Obama said.